and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to announce that the board met in executive session this evening to discuss personnel and legal matters. Are there any other board member comments this evening? Mr. Santucci? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to take a second uh, to recognize, <clears throat> excuse me, the passing of uh, Chief Justin McIntyre from the Brackenridge Police Department. Um, I happen to work in that area and, and know the family personally and uh, it's a difficult time for that community. It's a difficult time for that family. So if I could just ask uh, for just a, a brief moment of silence uh, for him. Thank you. Any other board member comments? Okay. Um, do we have anybody who signed up for public comments on agenda items? No one has signed up. Okay. Uh, we're going in a little bit of a different order tonight. So, Ms. Cozera, you are up first with policy. Gosh, I missed all that. Um, okay. So, so we um, have a number of policies um, on, on the board for, or on the agenda for second reading, um, which we discussed at our last meeting. Um, the um, policy 213 grading, pro grading procedures revisions, policy 217 grading graduation requirements revisions, policy 812 food services revision, 805 emergency preparedness and response revision, and a new policy 805.2 school security personnel. Um, so um, I would like to mention that we did get a little bit of feedback on the um, I believe is the grading procedures um, as far as the changes to the QPA. Is that the right one? Um, just some questions about um, the calculation. So as by way of reminder, this policy um, would modify the, um, the QPAs for the high school students for um, certain classes um, and the chart, the revised chart is at the end of the policy. Um, and we had discussed at our last meeting that the, um, for the students in the, during the pendency of the, like, during the transition period, there's gonna be a bit of a different way of calculating um, because it's, it's going to be effective this year or effective with the next year that the, the changes would be in effect so that their, their overall QPA would seem potentially lower than the current um, QPA scale would allow for and that's just a factor of the of the math unfortunately I think there would theoretically be a way to math it out and kind of say what it would be if they had gotten you know the grades that they got with the new scale but that's that's probably not something that we can necessarily take on is that um, Dr. Williams Dr. Manorino is that kind of a correct assessment of the situation it's an um, it's a little bit I mean it's it's understandable and and we we hope to, um, in, in the transcripts, and we talked about this a little bit at the last meeting, kind of adjust for that um, by noting that we changed the calculations during, um, during this school year or this upcoming school year as part of the policy. So um, that's the only feedback we got on any of these policies, so I just kind of wanted to mention that. Um, and I will then say the super recommend, superintendent recommends, and I so move that the board approve policy items two through six. D. Spade, I'll second that. Any discussion? Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Lori, uh, no to six. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Motion carries. Uh, now we will go to Mr. Little for education. All right. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, first up tonight, we have a presentation from uh, Dr. Beth Williams on uh, secondary scheduling and academic review. Good evening, everyone. I have the pleasure tonight of um, reviewing our PSSA and Keystone data from the 2021-2020 school year. So if you look at the data behind me, what we did on this first slide is we gave you the average number of advanced and proficients across all four grade, or I'm sorry, all four elementary schools. 
The red bar is representing the North Hills School District. The gray bar is representing the average for the state of Pennsylvania. So if you look at those three PSSA standards there, elementary ELA, elementary math, and elementary science, you can see by those scores that our elementary scores are 20% and sometimes higher above what the state average is. So we are very, very happy to see that. We did the same thing for the secondary, and that's specifically looking at our middle school grades, grades 6, 7th, and 8th. Again, the red bar representing North Hills, the gray bar representing the average for the state of Pennsylvania. And as you can see, again, with ELA, math, and science, we are also, again, anywhere from 15 to slightly over 20% higher than what is occurring at the state. Probably the number that is starting to jump out to you the most on this screen is you're looking at secondary math. So we're going to talk about that here momentarily. So what I wanted to do for you is look very specific at the PSSA data, the number of students with advanced and proficient at each grade level. The red bar again is ELA, the gray bar is math, and the black bar is science. Science scores are only up there in fourth grade and eighth grade because that's the only two times that science PSSA is offered. So if you look at the red across the bar, which is ELA, you can quickly see that 70 plus percent of our students scored proficient or advanced at these grade levels in ELA, which is the reading portion of the exam. You then can move to science, which is the black bar. You look in fourth grade, we had a great score of 91.6. Eighth grade, we were at 74.7. Almost 75 percent of our students were proficient or advanced. You then move to the gray score, which is math. And as you can see, going across grades three through six, the district or the grade levels are in the 60th percentile with proficient and advanced. Then you look at seventh and eighth grade, and you're seeing that there's a drop down to obviously the 30s percentile, 37% proficient and advanced for seventh grade, and for eighth grade, 32.6. So again, there is obviously some concern there. Are these scores that we're used to having at North Hills? Absolutely not. Not even close to our pre-pandemic scores. Are we happy with these scores? Absolutely not. Um, did we know this at the beginning of the year? We did, so we've been doing a lot of work with regard to this. But let me speak specifically to math, the difference between math and reading. That is not just a trend here at North Hills, but it's a trend across the nation. Something you need to know content-wise. Math is obviously very concrete and very sequential. It builds upon itself its skills. So if there are learning gaps in math, it is going to have a greater impact on a student's overall achievement. So again, those learning gaps in, in math are going to greater impact because if you don't have that foundational skill, you're not going to be able to build, which means when you take a test, standardized test, such as the PSSAs or the Keystones, you're probably, if you're going to have learning gaps, you're going to see a greater impact. Whereas reading or ELA, those skills are considered to be more recursive, meaning that they repeat annually. Yes, they're more in depth, kids learn to um, fine tune those skills, but you're practicing those skills year in and year out. You're reading informational text, you're reading fi fictional text, you're learning about inferences, you're learning about all those skills. So that's first and foremost, I think you, we need to understand that difference. Specifically to the seventh and eighth grade, there's some other things that I want to go ahead and mention with regard to that. Um, through our PSSA data, we get the data and we're able to really drill down into the data and we're able to look at what standards we do well at and what we don't do. And what we noticed last year in particular with seventh and eighth grade for the PSSA testing, we had a large number of students who did not even attempt to answer the open-ended questions. They didn't even answer them, they left them blank. If you don't answer those open-ended responses, you will not achieve a proficient or advanced score. That, that is a problem right there. Secondly, with regard to that, the middle school in particular had a larger number of opt-outs during that testing window, predominantly in seventh and eighth grade. Students did not choose to test. Many of those students are students who were taking the keystones, and they said, look, keystones are a graduation requirement. That's more important to me. I'm going to go ahead and opt out of the PSSAs. So that definitely affected our score because of the people that were taking the test. So again, addressing the elephant in the room here, we're not happy with these scores. 
We know there is room for improvement with regard to that. In all grades, not just the middle school, hold monthly data team meetings. We are using tools that we can measure growth and how we're changing learning gaps and what that needs to look like. And we are seeing that. So equally important, I think if I'm going to show you some of the data that you know is stuff that we really don't like to talk about a whole lot, but we have to acknowledge in order to get better, I think it's equally important to show you the data talking about our annual growth trends and that are occurring at the middle school. So what you're seeing up there are ELA and our math scores longitudinally and how we're achieving growth. And you're going to see a huge drop off, obviously, if you're going from 2019, 2020, in both ELA and math, down into 2020, 21, and 2021 to 22. The different colors are representing every subgroup category that we have in the buildings. So that is our ethnicities, that is our English language learner students, that is our economically disadvantaged students, that's our gifted students. So we are, believe it or not, showing growth. Okay, again, are we where we want to be? No, but this is showing me that we are attacking the problem, we are looking at those learning gaps, and that we are moving forward to close those learning gaps. It's going to take time. We have dug into the data. The teachers are working incredibly hard. And I am confident our scores are going to continue to improve with the interventions and strategies that they're using in the classroom. So moving from the PSSAs, let's talk a little bit here about the same thing with our Keystone average. Again, at North Hills represented by the red, um, the state represented by the gray. Um, algebra 1, 84.6% um, were advanced or proficient. The Algebra 1 keystone is taken by a small group of 7th graders, typically one section in 7th grade. Um, a couple sections, obviously, in 8th grade, and then we have ninth graders who take it as well. So that is not surprising to me that we're scoring well in that. Also, at the high school, you have to pass the Keystone exams or pass one of the Keystone pathways to go ahead and meet that graduation requirement. So oftentimes, we have, we'll have students at the high school who will take the test two or three times to obviously attempt to pass that. So that does factor into that score as well. I think the most important one that I want to highlight on this page is biology. Um, our teachers really knocked it out of the park with biology. That is considered to be the most complicated um, keystone because of the sheer breadth and depth of content and curriculum that is tested. And I know I stood up here year after year and said, look, this is a really tough test. To say we had 80% proficient and advanced at North Hills, that is incredible. Um, so they knocked it out of the park. So kudos to those teachers as well. And literature, as always, they continue to do a nice job with regard to that. And again, they continue to work on things such as informational text. And again, obviously, the writing aspect of that. So again, above the state average. So what does this mean? I just told you what our PSSA data is here for North Hills and our Keystone data. What does this mean with regard to the nation? There is something that's called the NAEP test that occurs every year. It's done by the National Assessment for Educational Progress. And it's an organization that serves as the nation's report card. They literally test schools in fourth and eighth grade specifically on reading and math. We happily are one of those schools that gets tested again on um, eighth grade every year. So they get the pleasure of taking the PSSAs. Some of those kids take the PSSAs and the Keystones, and then they turn around and they have to take the NAEP test. It is federally mandated. If you're selected, you're taking that test. You don't get an opt out of that test or that exam. And again, that is measuring where we're at and how well we're doing. Are we growing? Are we meeting the standards? What are we looking at? So last year's NAEP report card is not surprising. The numbers showed a significant decrease in both reading and math since 2019, right? Pre-pandemic -pre scores looked a lot different to what they've looked like coming out of the pandemic. Specifically, last year, 43 states showed decreases in math. Zero states showed increases. That is where math is at as a nation, again, because it's concrete and sequential. Interrupted learning, learning gaps, have a tremendous impact on overall student achievement in math. 30 states showed decreases in reading, and zero sh states showed increases. So again, the data right now, um, is showing that a lot of schools across the nation continue to struggle with this. 
um, local trends when I talk to colleagues, whether through the AIU or in other districts, are reflecting some similar findings. Some schools are doing better than others. Some are doing OK. Um, it's the same thing. We're relying a lot on pre-assessments. We're relying a lot on growth models and different tests, such as PVAS, which measures growth specifically. And are students able to do that? But we are seeing improvement. So we are moving forward um, to try and address and correct things to get us back to where we were pre-pandemic, which is a very successful district with testing. Um, but again, we've got some challenges, and we know that. And we are working diligently to address those challenges. So any questions on the PSSA or Keystone data that I can answer for you? Yeah, I am. I have one. You, sure. you mentioned that there's a rather, I guess, large influx of, of students opting out. Is now, is that larger than years prior? It is larger than years prior. Um, it, 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 last year it was definitely larger than years prior, and that occurred at the elementary schools as well. And I think the, the part of that that is important is to this next slide. That standardized data, while it gives you a snapshot of what your child is doing academically, and we can all say, yep, kiddo has a bad test day, that is just a glimpse of how your child's doing. It is important to us as a district that our students participate in the PSSAs because we rely on that heavily to evaluate the effectiveness of our curriculum. So we look at that to make determinations in the data. What is going really well here? What are our kids learning? Great. Why are they learning that? Are we spending this amount of time on it? Are we using the right programs? Are we aligned to the standards? Wait a second, we're not doing well on this. What do we need to do with the curriculum? So those standardized test scores are important to us because it helps us make the appropriate curricular decisions and teaching decisions that we need to meet the diverse learning needs of students. So I think, again, coming off the pandemic, there was a lot of um, hesitation about having kids participate in those exams for a variety of different reasons. Some parents were very open and honest after the testing window and just said, look, I rely more on what my teachers are telling you, what my child's teachers tell me about their progress than I do on the state test. But we need our students and our parents to understand we, we are teaching these skills on a daily basis. We are teaching how to do free responses, text-dependent analysis. We are teaching, in particular at the middle school, EBSRs, evidence-based standard responses. How do you do this? This is the way we're assessing kids on a daily basis. So that trepidation about, oh my gosh, am I able to do that? That's regular run-of-the-mill practice this year at the middle school. So we're hoping that's going to motivate and encourage students to say, yep, we want to go ahead and take this test. Um, but last year, it, it was a rough year, um, K through 8 for opt-outs. But the majority of them were in 7th and 8th grade at the middle school. Yes. Thanks. Do you get breakdowns um, per question? Uh, like, do we at, at the district level? Because I know when you get the responses, it's I do. kind of like you get like, you know, I do. you got four out of eight questions on geometry or whatever. I do. I get those yeah. responses, and then those responses go back to the building principles. They get the raw data is mm -hmm. what that is called, and they can go through, and then that's what they data mine with their teachers. Right. So the math teachers look specifically at those standards and say, okay, who hit this? Why are we hitting it? And you can go into it in our Ed Insight, which is our data warehouse. All that's dropped into there. And you can see, okay, who are the kids that specifically specifically scored maybe below basic on this anchor. So we can target it by student, by anchor. We can drill down to that level. And I know that was part of everyone's professional development, literally the opening week of school. Um, particularly, again, as I said, I know that was a focus um, at the middle school. Mm -hmm. Okay. And again, so that's one of the things that we use that for is the effectiveness of our curriculum. And we do use it to contribute to student placement, meaning this particularly as you start to have choice in the curriculum. K through six, you don't have choice, right? The curriculum's the curriculum. But as you start to move into seventh through 12th grade, you have choices as to what level math you want to take, what pathway you want to take in English, what courses you want to take. Our teachers do a really, really nice job of looking at that PSSA data, their coursework data, right? Their summative, formative assessments, their classroom grades, the recommendations, all of those pieces. And then when kids come to them and say, hey, what math should I take next year? And I'm looking at Mrs. Robleski because she does this on a daily basis at the high school. We're able to use that data to help kids and say, well, talk to us about what your plans are. What do you want to do next? Let's really sit down and talk about what we think the next path, best pathway is for your math. So that data is incredibly important to us. So we do use it in a variety of ways. 
And then last but not least, just briefly, a lot of information with regard to secondary scheduling is going to be coming out. So if you're going to be attending the middle school again next year, um, or new to the middle school, or new to the high school, or attending the high school next year, those scheduling windows are going to be opening very, very soon. The high school in particular will be opening at the end of the month. The middle school will open um, at the beginning of February. But there will be very, very specific de details that will be provided on the website and emails sent out by the building principals to parents outlining everything that that looks like to make sure you're in the loop and you know what's going on so you can have those conversations at home when it comes to scheduling because that is a very important part of the process okay any other questions for me yeah i just ha i just have a comment i just want to thank you for this i think this was a really important presentation and i think you know some of us on the board over the course of our time on here have talked about how much we want to hear for lack of a better word, the issues that our district sure. is dealing with as well. And so to see to see there, you know, an acknowledgement of the data and, and that we are confident in our ability um, to work on it, I think I really liked being presented that information as well. So thank you very much. No, I appreciate that. And, and I'm very, very comfortable and, and confident in stating this data is not reflective of how hard and what our teachers right. do every single day. It's not. It's not a reflection of who we are and what we're capable of. Um, but the good news is it's, it's just another opportunity for us to <laughs> roll up our sleeves and get back to work. And, and we accept that challenge and, and we'll continue to move forward positively. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we move on to our next uh, presentation, I, I forgot there is one announcement here I wanted to make. Um, I'm pleased to announce that the district's annual kindergarten forum will take place on Thursday, January 19th at 6.30 at Ross Elementary School. A panel of kindergarten teachers, specialists, and administrators will discuss kindergarten readiness, the readiness assessment, curriculum, and a, tip, and a typical kindergarten day in the North Hill School District. More information regarding kindergarten form and registrations can be found on the district website. Uh, this is a great night for parents and incoming kindergarten students as we look forward to meeting you. So, pretty me about that. Um, we're gonna move on to our next two presentations. We're really lucky to have uh, two awesome teachers that, that took time out of their evenings to come here and, and present. Um, first is Mr. Justin Kerr, talking about our K through six math pilot update. Good evening and thanks for having me this evening. Um, I'd like to provide you with an update on our current math pilot program. We are currently programming two pilot math programs in the elementary. Uh, we're piloting Houghton Mifflin Harcourt's Math and Focus 2020, and we're also piloting Reveal Math through McGraw-Hill. Uh, what led us to today, my first few slides, I'd like to give you a brief recap on where we are with our current pilot program today. Uh, we've been using Math and Focus 2018 for the past 10 years. We've uh, been able to identify some recurring issues in the program that we wanted to specifically look into and improve with our next math program. In doing that, we assembled a task force. The task force was uh, formed in April 2022, and it was composed of teachers, special education teachers, classroom teachers, math specialists, uh, gifted teacher, elementary principals, central administrators, and the curriculum leader. We reviewed a lot of different vendor presentations and we completed rubrics and discussed strengths and weaknesses to come to a consensus on two programs that we wanted to pilot, which as I previously mentioned, were Math and Focus 2020 and Reveal Math. Uh, we sought pilot teachers in grades K to six and in special education, and we chose two teachers per grade level and two special education teachers for each program. We distributed our selection equally among all four elementary schools and sixth grade at the middle school. And we gave uh, building math specialists uh, the online access so that they had the availability of the resources and materials to help their students who were both participating in the pilot programs. Our initial trainings began in August of 2022, and we had professional development for teachers. Reveal Math was on August 8th, and then Math and Focus 2020 was on August 12th. The focus of those trainings was to provide teachers with an idea of how chapter and lesson structure works within a program the resources they would have available to them to use throughout the school year, the technology available on each platform that was offered, the pedagogy and the program structure, and also a question and answer session with each of our trainers to provide any additional information they needed to pilot their programs this school year. We also are conducting quarterly meetings throughout the school year. We've already had a quarterly meeting for our first and second nine weeks period. Uh, for Math and Focus, we met on September 12th, and then again on December 12th, and for Reveal Math, we met, we met on September 19th and December 19th, both in after-school meetings. 
Uh, during that time, the pilot teachers were provided with time to ask questions uh, with our, virtually with our company trainers and discuss any of the resources that they needed additional information on. Pilot teachers were also provided time to have a discussion about the strengths and weaknesses of the program they were piloting, how they felt the program was an improvement over our current program, any setbacks they saw, and also any general comments they had while piloting. We have two additional quarterly meetings scheduled. Uh, in the third quarter, we'll be meeting in February 2023, and in the fourth quarter, we'll be meeting in April 2023. Also, Reveal Math pilot teachers had demonstration lessons back in November, second and third. For both of these dates, uh, we had a specific trainer coming in from the company that met with our pilot teachers, and the pilot teachers were given the option of choosing a specific lesson they wanted modeled for them. They were allowed to see the sample lesson, they were able to review resources with the trainer, discuss the structure of the lesson, how it was created, and the trainer was able to answer any questions. They requested this additional training as this program was different from what they were used to using, so they felt they needed that additional support, which provided the necessary support they needed. Uh, the Math and Focus 2020 pilot teachers did not feel that a demonstration lesson was necessary as they're already familiar with the lesson structure and comfortable with teaching the Math and Focus pedagogy. Uh, our vendor support has been fantastic. Both companies have absolutely been very accommodating. Uh, McGraw-Hill and Hooten Mifflin Harcourt both throughout our entire time with the pilot. Both vendors have been supportive of our teachers, answering any questions they have whenever they arise. And they've also offered many different opportunities for our teachers to support them with any questions they had. So for our future progress for the rest of the school year of our pilot, we'd like to survey the parents in the early spring for their input on both programs. Uh, pilot teachers are also going to be completing rubrics and evaluations of their pilot program summatively. Our goal for the end of the year, by May 2023, is to reach consensus on a pilot program to recommend for adoption during the 2024-2025 school year. And that will be part of our curriculum proposal next school year uh, for elementary math 2023-2024. Uh, if a pilot teacher's program is selected, then next year they would again teach that same pilot program until it, that program will be adopted in 2024, 2025. And if the pilot teacher's program is not selected, they will go back to teaching our current program, with the, which is Math and Focus 2018 next year until full adoption of our new program in 2024, 2025. Vertical articulation has also been a really important part for us. We've been trying to make, be very mindful of how this will affect us from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade in the math department. So Dr. Williams and Kim Robleski, who is our math seven to 12 curriculum leader, you'll be hearing from her shortly, uh, provided uh, the seventh and eighth grade teachers with reveal math materials so that they can preview those ahead of time. In the event that that were the program selected, they'd be familiar with those materials. And at this time, I'd be happy to answer any questions if you had any. I have, I have two. Um, how are the teachers feeling about the pilot? I, I think they're, they're excited. It's, it's a different change for them. Um, they've really embraced it. And what I've noticed more than anything is that we have teachers that work so hard, especially at the elementary level where I'm at, that are really trying to do the best they can for our kids and really use these programs to the best of their ability. So overall, I feel like they're very receptive to the new programs and taking on a challenge. Is there one they're liking more than the other? <laughs> there is not at this point. Okay. I've been asking that question, um, trying to pose that. You know, delicately, and now I'm becoming more um, persistent with that question along the way. And I think at this point in time, first nine weeks, it was really difficult for the Reveal Math teachers in the sense that it's a completely different program, so you really can't get a measure of it. Math and focus was something that they were used to, so sure, we like this, and they corrected some of the mistakes that we had seen in the earlier program. So I think after that second training there in November, now the Reveal teachers are feeling a little bit more comfortable. Now we're starting to get our feet under us where we're going to be able to start having some more discussions about, okay, give me some specific strengths and weaknesses. Um, so as much as it pains me to say, I think it's too early to tell. I don't think that we're necessarily um, leaning one direction versus the other. And I think that's actually a good thing. I think Justin has done an outstanding job of really not trying to coach one program over, over, over another. I think he's really trying to let the teachers have this experience with the students talking to the students, soliciting that feedback from the parents to make sure we're really looking at the data rather than just saying, okay, we're going through this pilot, but really behind the scenes, this is the program I think we should have. So I think he's done a nice job, a lot nicer than I have of saying neutral because he's, he's been very receptive of that. 
uh, while I've been trying to coach an answer out of them desperately, but I can't get one. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, and then my other question, maybe just a comment, I don't know. Um, my son is in one of the pilot classes, um, and I don't remember which, which pilot which curriculum he's doing. But I guess my question then is again, is about the parent survey. Um, because if I don't even know which curriculum he's the one he's, he's using, um, wh I guess what should parents be paying attention to over the next, you know, however long until we get that survey um, to be able to help you? I think we just started having that discussion. Um, Dr. Matthew's been helping out with that. And again, it's talking about a lot of it is what are you seeing at home? If homework is assigned, how are the students able to complete that? Are they coming to you for a lot of help? Are there seeming like there's some struggles? What does that look like? I think it's also looking at what the assessment data has looked like, right? How are students performing with regard to that? I think we'll be looking at a lot of that data, whether it's summative data in the classroom. Obviously, we're going to be looking very closely at PSSAs, some of those different pieces. So we're trying to kind of figure out what we want those questions to look like. Um, I do know no one has reached out to my office to say, hey, this, that, or the other thing about it, which I was kind of surprised about. I figured some parents would reach out to me at this point in time. I know they have not reached out to Dr. Matthew. <laughs> And as far as I know, Mr. Kerr, no one's reached out to you. Yeah. So we haven't had a whole lot of feedback from parents, whether yay or nay at this point in time. So we're trying to try and figure out what questions we should ask and how we can best do that. But this will come. There will be enough advance notice. Hey, we're looking for the survey. Here's what's going on. Those pilot teachers, those families will get that notification. So maybe then that will help gather your thoughts a little bit. Great. Thank you. Timing-wise, we will have PSSA results for the students in these tests June. before we know. June. So. Now, we'll make a recommendation probably at the May meeting, but we do meet. They'll make a recommendation um, in, in May, and then we'll kind of make what that right. determination is going to be. Um, I know from talking with the teachers and talking with Justin, kids are learning. And again, the reason we know that is because they use the iReady program, um, which is a diagnostic test that they use quite a bit, that it's aligned to the state standards to see how students are progressing. So they use that because that not only is a diagnostic, but it gives a pathway. This is a specific standard or anchor um, that the student is struggling with. And I know I'm very pleased to say that the iReady data, particularly in math, again, closing those gaps, has been very, very positive at the elementary. That I do know from Dr. Matthew and Mr. Kerr. But so following possible? up with that question, sorry. It's okay, mm -hmm. go ahead. Um, so going back to your presentation, the math data that we looked at in seventh yes. and eighth grade, and you talked about the foundational skills that kids were yes. missing in those grades. Obviously, those foundational skills are then taught in K to six, um, leading up to seventh and eighth grade. Is there a team looking at those specific skills that our kids were lacking in and seeing if those programs, these pilots, address those foundational skills where we're lacking? Yes, and one of the biggest things that we know that we're lacking across the board in math are math fluency facts. Our kids really, really struggle with that. That is something that is challenging K through six, K through eight for our students. That is something that they struggle with. That is something that the middle school teachers have mentioned that they are working on and they are using different programs here at the middle school to continue to build on that and supplement the curriculum. Math and Focus 2020, that was our biggest, one of our biggest criticisms of that. Also, its inability, I think, to provide resources for reteaching, remediation, um, and also for extension activities. Um, they've cleaned a lot of those things up. Now, the middle school, again, is not piloting that, but they've been pulling some other materials to supplement that because they're also teaching in certain circumstances also to the Keystone test as well. So we are looking very specifically at what that looks like, and that's some of the data that we are gathering because we do, again, understand that vertical articulation is critical. If these skills aren't learned at the foundational level and we just don't teach them in those learning gaps, we're seeing what that looks like. And I'm um, also wondering if the program circles back to those foundational skills because if you look at your data you presented, the, the elementary grades were not low in math. Correct. And then they dropped in the middle school. So those foundational skills were taught and they had mastered those 
in the lower grades, and then, and then somewhere they lost them in the middle school. Sure. To, so to see those circle back around, sure. I think is very important. And I do think part of that is also, again, when you look at like the NAEP testing with regard to eighth grade in general, it's the rigor that changes as well. As, as you know, as you go up into the grades, the rigor of the coursework also changes. So that has to be a piece of it. The curriculum looks different. It's differentiated a little bit different. So that certainly is another component with regard to that. It's not just the foundational skills, it's the application application of those skills because of the rigor. It looks different in the middle school. All of those things are things that we know, um, and all of those things is, that we are watching very, very closely with regard to that. Because again, it doesn't just stop at the elementary, and it doesn't certainly just stop at the middle school, hence the reason I have Mrs. Robleski here tonight, because this is going to bleed up eventually into the high school. Um, so this is something that we need to make sure that we're doing our due diligence with, and we're doing and gathering the data and the research and we're doing it correctly because it is K through 12. It's gonna have an impact one way or the other. Um, I'm just having, that was really loud, a little trouble reconciling like the previous presentation with this presentation because you discussed the importance of the PSSA data, mm -hmm. but then you said that we're not gonna be using that to make this decision and I understand it's because of the timing of it, but mm -hmm. I guess I just have some concerns that we're not using all the data that's available to us. Well, to um, really make a fully informed decision going forward on the math curriculum. Well, we'll get that data in June, and we won't be able to make any curricular purchase until July 1, until the fiscal year. So certainly that's something we're going to look at. And while they're going to make this recommendation, and they're going to say, hey, based upon this data that we have right here, obviously if there's problems with the PSSA, then that's going to be a conversation that Mr. Kerr and I are going to have to have with Dr. Matthew in the summer. So again, <laughs> That's the only good news about saying, hey, look, our fiscal year doesn't really start until July 1. And again, we'll know what it's going to be budgetarily, either price-wise, what it's going to look like. Mr. Muth, is that okay? Because you're kind of looking at me <laughs> like, I just want to make sure, because money again, I want to make sure Hopefully I'm not misspeaking they, on the finances. Hopefully they cost the same amount. I am going to guess, <laughs> quite frankly, they're going to be comparable. Yeah. I think they're going to be in the same ballpark, and I think it's going to be a, a decent chunk of change for lack of a better word. Mr. Muth is smiling at me as I say that. <laughs> well, it's an investment in our children's education. I think the data proves just that and how vital it really is uh, when it comes to it. It is, and again, as much as I look at the curricular piece and important that that is, you know, again, you know, I have faith in our teachers that they understand what the standards are and is this aligned to it and what they're seeing in the classroom and the data that they're seeing. Um, they are the content area experts. So if they're going to come back to me and say, we've gathered this data and this is what we have, summative, formative, this is the coursework, these are the grades, this is really, really important, I think that weighs very, very heavily what their recommendation is going to be. There's a and, lot and of, I trust that. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of factors, too. They've only got so many classes that are doing this, and, you know, obviously sure. it sounds like the teachers are pretty excited, so. They are. Know, they are working very great. hard yeah. to implement it with mm -hmm. fidelity, and, it, and yeah. it's tough. Um, and they're doing a great job with regard to that. Again, coming out of interrupted education, you know, post-pandemic, learning gaps, they've embraced this, and, and they're doing a really nice job with it. Um, and I know Mr. Kerr has worked very hard to make sure yeah, that I, this is going well. I wanted to extend that, you know, that thanks as well. I mean, I, we, I think we all really appreciate the time that you have put in and that all these yeah. pilot teachers have put into, you know, really making sure. Because as we just talked about in Dr. Williams' presentation, it's incredibly important that our kids, you know, understand and um, like math better than Dr. Williams does. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. No one is more happy that they are both here tonight to discuss math than I am. <laughs> Yeah, just to piggyback off of what my colleague, Ms. Cazera, said, you know, I just want to say, because we're on record, but, you know, you really do deserve, for lack of a better term, your flowers right here, because you come after to meet with us at the Education Committee meeting. This is a big, heavy lift, and you've always been there willing to talk to us and give us insight and updates. So I just wanted to come out publicly and just say I recognize you for that and thank you for it, because this is a big, like you said, this is a big, it's very important. big decision here. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Okay, uh, next up we have another one of our teachers here, um, Mrs. Robleski, talking about math overview for grades 7 through 12. Good evening. Era, thank you. So thank you for having me here tonight. Um, 
as this year has gone along, Beth and I have had several meetings um, talking about 7 through 12, um, a lot of discussion about the middle school. And just to give a little bit of background to you all, in case this is, these are things you don't know, but as it says in that second bulleted item there, you know, the differentiation of math really begins in seventh grade as far as different levels that the students can take. And I'm really, really passionate about kids getting placed correctly in seventh grade. Because if they are not placed correctly in seventh grade, they can end up being a kid who loved math up until that point and ends up truly hating it at some point in their high school career. And we see that at the high school. And it is very, very disturbing. And it really upsets me because I don't think anybody should hate math. I mean, it's, it's very concrete. It's clear. You know, it's the, the one thing I think kids should say, hey, I get this, because there's one answer that's right, and that's the one, and we should all be able to see that. So seventh grade is really, really important that the kids get placed correctly. What I really want to stress is that we all need to lose sight of, or we need to sort of lower what we expect as far as where we put kids in seventh grade. Not every child should be at the highest level in seventh grade. That does not mean that they can't be a great math student at some point in their career. They can be. They all can be, but they have to be ready for it. They have to be cognitively ready for the skills that we're giving, you know, the things we're trying to teach them. So, in seventh grade, we should have a small group of students taking Algebra one, Because if you look at research and you look across the board, there aren't a whole lot of kids ready for algebra in seventh grade. It is just too high for where they are cognitively at that age. Most kids are ready for pre-algebra type of skills. And if we sort of look back on what was already talked about tonight with not having the foundation, okay, and getting to those PSSAs in seventh and eighth grade, a lot of, I think, why the kids are not doing as well in the seventh and eighth grade PSSAs is because we do have more kids taking Algebra one. The teachers can't teach both sets of curricula in one period a day for seventh grade math, eighth grade math, and Algebra one. They can't do it all. So if you notice, the Algebra scores are really good, right? Because the teachers are teaching Algebra one. And so the kids are doing well on that test. But a lot of the skills on the seventh and eighth grade PSSA are not things that are covered in Algebra one. So truthfully, for a kid to really be taking Algebra in seventh grade, and even eighth grade, those skills that are on the PSSA should be things that just kind of come to them because they're just that much higher and that much, you know, they just have that kind of ability to see those things. If we have them skip seventh grade math, eighth grade math, those pre-algebra skills, they're missing some of those things that they probably need to be able to perform better on the seventh and eighth grade PSSA tests. They'll learn what you teach them, but the state requires that we give both of those tests to seventh grade kids and eighth grade kids if they happen to be taking algebra at the same time. So that is, that's an issue. I mean, these kids are asked to take two tests, but they're being taught really one of the curriculum, which is the algebra. So that's an issue that, you know, we just have to deal with because the state makes us give both tests to these kids. So I think that's why we had a lot of kids opt out or their parents decided they didn't want them to take it because it's testing these kids on two different things. So seventh grade, very important. We are going to go back now that we are able to do that because we're through COVID for the most part, to the kinds of criteria students needed to be placed in Algebra one in seventh grade. We're gonna look at PSSA scores. We're going to look most importantly or talk to their sixth grade math teacher. That's the most important thing and find out from their sixth grade math teacher is this student ready for Algebra one? What have you seen? 
you know, scores, you know, work habits, desire to be there. I mean, these are all things we need to really get from the kid as to whether they're ready for that kind of challenge in seventh grade. We have to go back to that because for the past couple years, because everything was so crazy, we really weren't able to stick to the criteria that we needed to get students placed in seventh grade if they were ready for that in seventh grade for Algebra One, We have a lot more students take it in eighth grade. And that's okay, I mean, you know, that's a year later. So we do have more kids that are ready in eighth grade. But I think it's important to know that if a student takes Algebra One in ninth grade, that is okay. That is not saying that that student is behind or that they're not as smart. It's just saying that they weren't ready at age 13, 12, 13, whatever it was, but by ninth grade they are ready. And I think we have to really focus on putting a kid where he or she belongs at the right time. Because what we are seeing is that in a few years ago, I know we had between 80 and 90 seventh graders taking Algebra One, And I will tell you that the biggest Calc two section we have ever had is about 17 you know, 17 to 18 kids, when we had 80 of them taking seventh grade algebra. And if that's the goal, so that you can get so advanced in math, then why are only 17 of them getting to Calc 2 by the time they're seniors? They're dropping off. They're getting, maybe they get through Algebra 1 okay, and maybe they get through Geometry. They get to Algebra 2 as a ninth grader, and they're not ready to handle the level of that class. It's a really difficult math class. So, I think we need to scale back. We need to make sure we're placing these kids appropriately. And so that's why this vertical articula articulation is really important, that we get back to having the criteria that helps us place kids appropriately. Uh, the middle school program of studies will have the different course options. I know at the high school we have a nice program of studies also, which has a lot of course options. The um, website should have the video that I've made, which talks about scheduling at the high school, I know. Um, there are several documents that we've used for years that have very detailed, you know, if you're in this class and this is your grade, <laughs> this is where you should be going next year. Of course, there are exceptions. You know, we can't always stick to that. But it is a good guideline to use for parents as you're looking to schedule, you know, for next year. Um, what are your options if you're in this class this year? Here are your options for next year. We do have some electives. You know, we have kind of the main pathway which goes through our three core courses, Algebra, Geometry, Algebra 2. And then if you continue, there's Trigonometry, Trigonometry and Pre-Calc, and then the Calculus classes. But we also have some electives, some statistics, computer programming, things like that, which of course are not requirements, but are good for students who think that they may be going on to something where those courses would be useful for them. At the high school, this is just on the side, there are um, a list of the courses we offer. And you can certainly find more detailed descriptions of those when you look in our program of studies. But those are the classes we offer. We have a nice selection for students and you know, different interests. We're keeping three credits of math for a graduation requirement. So we, of course, encourage students to take four if they really like math. And we have a lot of students that do take four credits of math, but three is what is required. And then, you know, the numerous courses are listed over there that they can select from. Any questions for me? Because I, 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 I have one, and, you know, yes. prior to this, you and I were discussing, and, and Mrs. Spade, you were there just talking about how we as board members rely on folks like you and Mr. Kerr who are in those classrooms to give us those professional opinions. And you, you kind of painted the picture that we have too many students off right from the get-go in seventh grade taking advanced classes that kind of, uh, if they don't perform well there, kind of sets that pathway for kind of dissuading them from uh, their taste and enjoyment of math. Yes. Uh, you kind of mentioned the, the, I think you said about 80 to 90 students are, are in Algebra 1. Well, this was, a few, this was a few years ago. Okay. The numbers have come down. 
just a, just anecdotally, I'm just trying to get this. When you say there needs to be less, so let's just say there are 90 students, right? Mm -hmm. How many would you believe, like in your professional opinion, should really actually be in Algebra 1? In seventh grade, I would, obviously, it's going to change from year sure, to year, but sure. I would say there should be probably around 20. Okay. And I, again, and I understand it's anecdotally, there but there are going to be about twenty kids okay. who are just so naturally it's typically gifted. a section. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's that's what I was One trying section. to get at when you said I, I was just trying to figure out a number. And of course, we're just ballparking, but that gives me a better understanding of of really who should be in there. Okay, right. thank you. And I mean, I want kids to be challenged as much as they possibly can. I mean, if a kid is truly just blowing it out of the water with math, of course we want to put them in as advanced a class as he or she can handle. I mean, that's mm -hmm. wonderful when you see kids like that that just love it so much and they can just do whatever you give them. But that's not, there's not 90 of those kids in a class Yeah. for the most part. You know what I'm saying? It's mm -hmm. just, and, and if, we, if we make them feel like to not do that it means that they're not doing enough or that they're, you know, to try to compare kids that way. And I just, I, I hate that because I feel like kids are then feeling like, well, I'm not in that class, so I must not be a very good math student. That's not true. It sounds like we also have that, yeah, the, the societal the societal aspects thing. of it, sure. And you know, I'm, be careful about what I say, but you know, that's, this is not <laughs> about somebody being able to say, well, this is the math class my child is in. I mean, when you, when you get to that point, you are doing your child such a disservice mm -hmm. by forcing them into something that they're not ready for. Because what we see over and over again are these kids who loved math at one point, they really did, and they don't love it anymore. Mm -hmm. Because they're just being asked to do things they're not ready cognitively to do. And I just think we have to get away from that. So, what are some of the factors in the criteria for making it into that class? Well, we used to use data checkpoints, but the past couple of years, because we either didn't have PSSA scores, and we used the HANA-1, um, HANA New Orleans Algebra Readiness Test. That test is no longer being made. So that is one of the reasons, when you look at the program of studies tonight for the middle school, um, there's two changes with regard to that, and it's going back to looking what that data criteria is. So Kim and I met with the seventh and eighth grade math teachers and said, look, we don't have the hand in New Orleans. What do you want to use? What specifically do you want to look at? So certainly it's teacher recommendation. We need to talk to the sixth and seventh grade teachers and see what they're recommending students for. We want to look at their CDT scores because there are cut scores based to the standards as to what that's going to look at like. And obviously then we're going to look at PSSA scores um, and what that needs to be. So we need to go back to those data checkpoints, again, that we used pretty stringently um, pre-pandemic so we can explain that with regard to that. And that was quite frankly always the norm. It was the norm when I started in this district yeah. many, many years ago um, when the ninth grade were here, any parochial students we gave a benchmark assessment to and sat down and discussed the results and what math class that they should be taking in in ninth grade based on those results. And without having those tools available to us and then, you know, the changes that occurred with the grading policy and things throughout the pandemic, that influenced and affected some things. And again, those cohorts are pretty much through the middle school now, but they're bleeding across the street to the high school. Um, so again, some of those skills and some of those gaps, the high school teachers are now combating, for lack of a better word, those lingering after effects. Do we ever do any kind of like exit survey for parents specific to like math and how they felt about their child's math experience throughout mm -hmm. the district or um, any sort of case studies or, or like looking at a child's journey through the district of different math classes and, and their success levels? To my knowledge, we've never done no. anything like that. I think the only thing that we've ever done, um, Mrs. Mathis, is we have done when they're on um, curriculum cycle. They obviously send out that survey to parents right. and ask them, but we have never looked longitudinally at that. And again, Kim, I don't know if you've ever done anything over at the high school. I know when I was there, we never sent any type of survey to our graduating seniors or anything saying, hey, talk to us about this and what your experiences are. We, we've I, never, as long as I've been around, I haven't heard of that. I just wonder if that could be beneficial, particularly as we talk about like if kids enter middle school at the wrong level or they start taking sure. advanced classes too soon then they kind of either lose interest or run out of math classes that they want to take at a higher level and 
I feel like that data might be helpful. I think it would be too, and I know that I've talked to Mrs. Robleski mm -hmm. just recently about um, the AIU does a really nice job. They have the Math Science Consortium down there. They also offer um, some help with math if you want to really talk about what your math program looks like. Um, and I think we've decided um, that we're going to take advantage of that because while we know we're moving in a direction with the pilot, that pilot, again, is going to influence what we're doing K through 12. So I'm planning on reaching out to the AIU and talking to them just to say, hey, look, here's where we're at. Here's what our data is showing. Um, you know, is there professional development you can offer us? Is, is this a, a fish or a water problem? And I say that because, again, you know, is it a curricular problem where it's the water, it's kind of everything, it's the curriculum, we need professional development. Is it a cohort? Is it post-pandemic? Is it everything? It, and what is the direction out of this? Because, again, we all want to continue to do our very best for our kids. And I think if we could have some people come in from the outside who are experts in this and provide us with some guidance, Again, I'm a big fan of let's rip the Band-Aid off, let's identify the good, let's talk about what we need to fix, and let's get a game plan together. So I think that's what the next steps are going to be, and that's certainly going to involve um, Mrs. Robleski, and I want to involve Mr. McKiernan and Mr. Um, Lyons as the two secondary principals as well um, at this point in time. And certainly we'll keep Justin in the loop as well as we need to. But I think that, in my mind, is kind of another step that we want to take to get some more information from this because they, they might give us a completely different approach to this and we need to get it right. It's that simple, we need yeah. to get it right. When yeah. we talk about placement into these classes, you know, this isn't my personal world yet because my kids are in elementary school still, mm -hmm. but so where does the bottom line fall? Is it, is it parents, do parents get to push for their kids to be in these classes or does the district get to say, no, you're not ready? So where, how does we, that decision get made? We do have prerequisites. Those are in the program of studies, and we do have prerequisites. And obviously when it starts to become differentiated, grades 7 through 12, saying, hey, this is what you need to meet for this. We also have something which is called um, a parent override. So if a parent feels very strongly, and in particular I would say even at the high school, if a student feels very strongly that they want to be challenged, that is also something that we look at because, again, if a student wants to challenge themselves, and again, this would not be Beth Williams, and say, hey, let me go take trig, never happening. No. Um, if I wanted to challenge myself that way, we also want to offer students that security of doing it in high school mm -hmm. as opposed to waiting until college to see, hey, this is an experience I can take in high school. I'm no, there's no tuition <coughs> attached to this with regard to this. There is a drop out. I can do what I need to do with regard to that. Um, but again, that's where it's very important <coughs> with our math teachers, that they're a part of that dialogue and that discussion. So they can answer both parent and student questions um, with regard to that, because they can talk about the work skills, the study skills, mm -hmm. the habits, um, the thinking, the concreteness of it, and all those different skills that they need in math a lot more. <coughs> so that is definitely part of the scheduling process. We ask our teachers, again, at any level course, to have those meetings with students and really talk about, OK, you're in Algebra 1 this year, or you're leaving geometry. That's probably a better example at the high school. <coughs> you're leaving geometry. You have all these different ways to go in math. Let's really talk about what you were doing in this class, and let's talk about what your post-secondary plans are and what you want to do, and they will help guide those <coughs> conversations. But there is an override, so if parents do really want to push that, and even if we say, hey, we don't recommend, and they say, yes, we want to go, we have accepted those overrides. Yes. Because in seventh grade, there wouldn't be math prereqs yet, right? So it would be... In Algebra 1, there it, is a prereq. In, in seventh grade, it is leveled. There are different levels in there. So again, when you look at the middle school program of studies, you're going to see that we're looking again at data a lot more closely than what we did. We're going back to pre-pandemic because we have PSSA scores and we're replacing the New Orleans HANA testing with the CDTs. So there's some more data checkpoints, which we haven't been able to use because it hasn't been around for the past couple of years. So the goal as a district then would be able to tell more kids with data, no, you're not ready for this. Parents and students sure. absolutely yeah. involve them in that conversation. And again, okay. this is our recommendation as content professionals or educational professionals, yes. Okay. Mrs. Robleski, I'd just like to thank you for uh, your time coming in here. Your passion is very evident. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's I think that's a good thing. I myself am, am a math nerd. Uh, I love it. It's the only thing that doesn't lie. You don't have to be persuaded, you know. Um, and as a parent of a sixth grade student um, who's doing very well in math, uh, 
there's no tears this year. Shout out to Mr. Polero. Um, so <laughs> like, we don't have any tears this year about math. Uh, she has a good grade, but she has to work really hard at it. And I think that as a parent, if, if I didn't have the perspective that I do of math and how it proceeds, it might be easy to kind of be fooled by the numbers, so yep. to speak, Absolutely. and say like, wow, well, she's got a really good grade. Let's get her into Algebra 1. Um, so that might be a little bit of the uh, sort of like the issue. Like she, she does homework every night, and she's on iReady every night, and we're still trying to work on her fact fluency and getting her ready uh, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. those things. But I think that that might be conversations um, that, that need to be had that are tough conversations. Mm -hmm. um, Agreed. And if there's anything that we can do at, at our level to help facilitate that, you know, we would be more than welcome to do that. Right, and I like to, I mean, I like to use the example of myself and my own children, you know, I mean, of course I wanted my three kids to all be math geniuses, like that's what I would have loved. And, you know, they're all pretty good at math, but none of them took classes ahead of where most kids do in their school district. And I was fine with that because I know the other side. And I thought, I want my kids to be taking classes when they're ready. And I help them a lot at home. And I see it, and I know. And it's just, and they, they've gotten through without any major tears, without any major incidents, because I feel like they took the classes when they were ready to take them. And did they have friends that were taking classes before they were? Yeah, they did. But that's OK, because it's not about you know, when you get there. It's about how you do when you get there. And if you're, if you're ready for it, then it's so much better of an experience. And the kids continue to like math and believe that, as you said, it's the one subject that doesn't lie. It's the one subject that we all should be able to understand because it's so clear and it's so, and I just, I, I just feel terrible when kids end up hating it and that they shouldn't. They really shouldn't. There's no reason. And I just really, I do, I do feel very passionate about it. And so I really want to work hard in the next couple years to make sure that we're placing kids correctly so that they have a positive math career through our school and I do like your idea of maybe figuring you know talking to some kids and some parents and seeing what their math journey was like and seeing mm -hmm. if it wasn't great where did it go wrong yeah you know where was it that you started mm -hmm. to not like you math and why even hook those people up with the people who are really pushing their kids right I mean like <laughs> not, this is what could happen to you right. well yeah I mean it's, it's hard like I'm thinking about it I have a seventh grader and it's it is kind of the first choice that you get to make yes and, yes. and you know yes. and, and if it's some a peer thing too if right it's a peer thing sure yeah and and just kind of and somebody comes and says your kid should be in x y you know this class and and you're kind of like well you know they're doing so well and, and you don't sure. have all those those facts and you don't know you know it like, is hard as a parent yeah. to hear that you know or to to not have them take the absolute best because you sure. worry like well if I if they don't take the highest level is it gonna slow them down or is right. it going to there are going to be options eliminated for them because they're not taking you know the up but that's that's not what it is mm -hmm. and you know I mean by not taking algebra in seventh grade you're not going to get to calc 2 as a senior that's true but realistically there are there's really no student who needs Calc 2 in high school. Amen. I mean, even if you're going to be an engineer. <laughs> Amen. Tell us, how, tell us again how much Woo. you hate math. <laughs> you Honestly, really even if you're going into the most heavily mathematical career, you don't need Calc 2 in high school. You will get it it's when different. you need it. Yeah, I mean, like, I know it was a similar situation when I was in high school, but it was in eighth grade that this choice happened, right? Like, and so it's even a year earlier and, right. than it was right. in mm -hmm. the you know, olden days. And, but we have it. We have it for the kids who are ready for it. And it's awesome. Right, Those right. kids are awesome. You know, it's awesome to see how much they can do as a high school senior. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that other kids won't eventually do it. They'll just do it, yeah. you know, in college. Or they'll do it when they're ready for it. I think and just having just, that conversation with parents and yeah, figuring out the messaging. I would agree messaging. with that because yeah, I'm sitting here. I'm a seventh grader, too. 
I had no idea what any of the class options were. We came home with the paper, and I said, well, why isn't she going to algebra? Well, thank God we didn't go to algebra <laughs> because we're barely making it through 7A <laughs> at this point. Um, but I think an explanation like that and mm -hmm. saying, right. hey, here's how difficult this really is going to be. It could really put your kid back if you push to get them ahead. Right. Uh, I and think I've, that told, would be I've told beneficial. Beth many times, I mean, I would be happy to have this conversation for a group of parents if, if we could get them assembled yeah. somehow, but I don't know how that works. I think if you did the scheduling video at the high school, and I've seen that video where you've talked about this and laid this out, right. I am really wondering, again, sixth grade, the math is the math. I'm really wondering if we need to do a scheduling video for 7th and 8th grade and explain that with you as the curriculum leader talking about that. I, I think that would be very, very beneficial to do that. And again, there's a lot fewer sure. choices here than what you have in the high school. But I think right. if you could say that, I think that would be something that parents could tune into and be able to have that conversation. Because we really don't have a scheduling night for um, rising 7th graders right. or rising 8th right. graders. But if we could put that in the video, we could use our weekly emails, we could start blasting that out there because it is the first time they get to choose. Mm -hmm. and, and having that information, I think if you're willing to do that, and you and I can chat about that a little bit more tomorrow, yeah. you know, I'll help you out any way I can. If we, we could get that there, I think that would be a huge help because I think it would be communicated um, and they could see that transition and what it carries up to into the high school. And, and again, that's what I would suggest because it's been very effective at the high school. I know a lot of people use that video. Okay. I know that's they good. do. I just want to echo the echo the thank yous. Um, I am not a math person. I'm an ELA social science person, and I can't believe how interesting this these presentations on math were to me. <laughs> so thank you very much. They were very very interesting and informative. They, they were wonderful. Yeah, thank you and for getting me off either. the hook. <laughs> so love you, Ben. Absolutely. I want you all to know that Beth hates math so much. <laughs> yeah. So much. I get there's high. A sign, one take there's away. a sign in her office yes. that says math. Yes. I'm not a therapist. Solve your own problems. Yes. <laughs> That's how much. I get hives <laughs> to this day. I get hives. I, I used to come in and observe you. You right. All the observations. <laughs> and I took <laughs> out And everyone's like, should we ask Mrs. Williams? And I'm like, no, please don't ask Mrs. Williams. And the kids are always so great. Well, you want to be in our group. No, no, you don't want me in your group, kids. Um, the students were always lovely to me. But yes, I still get hives to this day thinking about that. <laughs> well, I wish I would have had y'all as teachers. I probably would have loved it, right? I feel they terrible. placed you properly. And you yes. all set. <laughs> Yeah. When we interview math teachers and they have us do like those sample lessons, I panic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Like, we don't like have to be a student. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, they, Kim takes very, we took very good care of me when I was at the high school and here at the middle school, and now I have Justin taking very good care of me at the elementary. So I'm very, good. very lucky to have both of them as curriculum leaders. They do an outstanding job, as do all of our curriculum leaders. So thank you. And I'd like to say thank you to both of you for coming, sure. and thank you for your honesty. And I really hope parents were watching tonight to hear this. Mm -hmm. I think, again, that scheduling video will go a long way. Yeah, that's, that's we'll fine. Yeah, I can certainly do that. Thanks, Kim. Yep. Thank you. Sure. Uh, moving on tonight, we have uh, two items for under consideration. Our first one here is item number five. And that's that the board approved the program of studies uh, for the high school for the 2023-2024 school year. Um, moving on here to number item, item number six is also that the board approved the program of studies for the middle school uh, for the 2023-2024. Uh, both of these were as per the attached. So the uh, I move that education items five and six be added to the legislative meeting agenda. D. Spade, I'll second that. Um, thank you. I have a question for Dr. Williams. There's no um, like overview sheet attachment with the middle school program of studies. Yeah, I'm not sure what a happened with that. Summary of the changes. I actually pulled that up. So there were grammatical changes, obviously the year changes, but the two biggest changes were two things that went through curriculum council. Number one, there was an art class that was called digital fabrication, which is now changed. The curriculum is the same. We changed the name to digital art 
eight, and I can send you this. I have the memo sitting in front of me. Um, and then the second thing are those prerequisites that we just discussed for Algebra one in both seventh and eighth grade um, using data, and that is going to be incoming Algebra one students are required to meet the following criteria, um, and it's talking about um, sixth grade scores, CDT, teacher recommendation, advanced score on the sixth grade math, PSSAs, and I can send that to you as the board. I have that memo here um, with regard to that. So again, it's the new revised prereqs because we don't have the New Orleans HANA test. Um, and again, it's that change from digital fabrication to digital art, the naming. Any other discussion? There are a couple of, um, maybe we have the older version, but on pages five, six, and seven, there are some years that are not quite right and names, so like they have so the- what? Which one? Of the middle school, I'm, I'm, I apologize. Um, they have the last year's student representatives um, to the board and that sort of thing. So they, yeah. those, it's just all administrative, but the years need to be updated. And they, the graduation years are not right either. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will absolutely take that and I will get those changed and get you a corrected draft sent out to you tomorrow along with a memo outlining those changes for you. Thanks. Any other discussion? Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, Mrs. Poniatowski, I believe you have a report for us this evening. Yes, much lighter note. There's no math involved, so we're all safe. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that our Unified Bocce team's first ever game um, is coming up this Tuesday, January 10th, versus Avonworth, and it's in the high school gym. Um, everyone is invited to come out and cheer the kids on. They've worked so hard, they've practiced so hard, and I know they're really excited um, about participating in this. So if you plan to attend, please be there around 2.30 for player introductions. Um, and the team's remaining schedule is January 31st at 3 p.m. at Shaler, February 8th at 3 p.m. That's a home meet versus Deer Lakes. And uh, February 8th will also be senior night where the seniors will be recognized. So we invite everyone to come um, support our kids. Is that online, that schedule? Uh, probably. OK. <laughs> Dr. Manorino? I'm not going to remember all that. Heather? <laughs> I don't know the website or not. But. OK. I would put it on social media. Very cool. OK. That's okay. great. Thank you. Um, I don't know if everybody knows how much work you put into this, Mrs. Poniatowski, bringing it to the district, but I just want to say thank you, because I know it was a real passion project of yours, and I think this is going to be great for the kids, so thank you. Thank you, and I can't take all the credit. McKiernan and Weber at the high school <laughs> did all of the heavy lifting, all of the leg work. I just, yeah, the idea. But um, they did all the work, so, so they get all the credit for it, and the special education team at the high school has put so much work into the practice schedules, getting the kids... Um, rallied for this and doing all that, so it's it's all them. They did all the work. Well, I know I know you were involved, so thank you from the board perspective. Um, Mr. Santucci, do you have anything under buildings and grounds this evening? Uh, no, there are no items under buildings and grounds. Okay, um, Mrs. Neese, do you have anything under community and intergovernmental relations? I don't, but I did want to um, say thank you to all the PTOs and the PTAs and the PTSOs. They put together over break a really great ice skating event for all of the kids. Um, it was really nice. They got three hours to go and skate. Um, it was really fun to see all the kids playing together and get to hanging out. Um, outside of school, so I just want to thank them for that because it was a fantastic event. So, oh, um, yeah, I'll be meeting with them at the end of January again. Okay. But no other updates. All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, on to finance. Um, under finance this evening, we have the general fund bills, the capital project fund bills, the food service fund bills, budget transfers, Payroll for the month of December 2022 in the amount of $3,312,742.36. And then we have um, a request for the board to approve resolution 2023-01, limiting authority under Act 1 to increase the real estate tax rate for the 2023-2024 year by no more than the index of 4.8%. So basically, this is something that we have um, approved every year. Um, Act 1 requires the board to declare whether or not the district intends to request a tax increase above the Act 1 index for the upcoming year. 
and by approving the attached resolution, the board will be, will be waiving that option and will not be allowed to increase the real estate tax rate or any other tax rate by more than 4.8% for the 2023-24 fiscal year. Um, approvement, approval of this resolution is in no way indicative of an uh, intention to raise taxes at all. Um, it simply limits the maximum amount of any possible tax rate increase. So I will move that finance items two through seven be added to the legislative meeting agenda. D. Spade, I'll second that. Any discussion? I ask this every year, and I will ask it again <laughs> to clarify. Um, with respect to the um, resolution, the only time that we would not do something like this is if we were in dire financial straits. We wouldn't, we wouldn't just raise taxes above the index just because we have particular desire and need. It's, it's a pretty serious thing to do this. I think it would be a, a definite reflection that we were in some kind of financial trouble. Right. I agree. And we have not done that historically. Right. Thank you. Um, I just want to call out on the food service fund bill. If you look at it, there is um, a purchase to Sorgles. And I think it's really nice to see, um, you know, a local farm uh, on, our, on our food service bill. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Ms. Philpott, do you have anything under health and wellness this evening? No, our second semester meetings um, have not started yet. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Spade, you are up with personnel. Thank you. Items are discussed in executive session. The superintendent recommends and I so move that the board approve personal items one and two. Is there a second? Mike Santucci, I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, we do not have a report on A.W. Beatty this evening, but I do have um, an update on the Westview project under the Westview Ad Hoc Committee. So the next phase of the Westview El um, Elementary School renovation project will begin later this month. This phase includes the demolition of the current main office along Chalfant Avenue where a new addition will be built. As we discussed in December when SiteLogic presented to us, there is asbestos in the building. And this was not a surprise since the building is almost 100 years old. Um, however, this week additional asbestos was found while preparing for this work. This has to be removed um, now in order to begin this phase of work and keep the project on time. We can't wait until the summer as planned to remove this particular area of asbestos. So the abatement will begin over President's Day weekend, February 18th through 20th. The entire area will be secured and sectioned off from the main building and all precautions will be taken to ensure that the asbestos is safely removed. Parent-teacher conferences and kindergarten registration on Monday, February 20th will be held as scheduled. During phase two of the project, the main office and the nurse's office will be relocated to the gymnasium lobby along Bell Bellevue Avenue and this will be temp uh, the temporary main entrance to the school. This will take effect January 30th through at least December of uh, 2023. Arrival and dismissal will also be impacted during this time, and we've posted complete details on our website, um, nhsd.net. So I just want to thank everybody in the community for their patience and cooperation during this time. The district strives to make uh, this whole project minimally disruptive. Um, and the remainder of the previously discovered asbestos will be removed this summer when the students are not in school as planned. Um, okay. And then do we have anybody signed up for public comments on non-agenda items? No one has signed up. Okay, great. Um, then I just have a couple of additional announcements to make. Um, the end of the first semester and marking period two is one week from today, next Thursday, January 12th. There is no school for the students the next day, Friday, January 13th. I always forget this, so I like to like <laughs> remind people. Um, the teachers have a clerical day, and there is also no school on Monday, January 16th, in observance of Martin Luther King Jr. Day. As Mr. Little mentioned, um, the annual kindergarten forum for parents of incoming 2023-24 uh, kindergarten students will be held on Thursday, January 19th at 6.30 p.m. in the Ross Elementary School Auditorium, and I just want to highlight that, th that this event is just for parents or guardians only. Um, kindergarten registration will then open on February 1st. 
Thursday, March 16th, is the elementary celebration of learning at Highcliffe, McIntyre, and Ross Elementary Schools. Um, and so for that reason, we have decided to, to cancel the school board meeting for that night. Anything that requires immediate board action for the month of March will be voted on at the March 2nd meeting. Items that do not require immediate action will be moved to the April 13th meeting. And finally, our next meeting of the board is in two weeks, Thursday, January 19th, right here in the North Hills Middle School LGI room, beginning at 7 p.m. Um, if there's nothing else this evening, I will move to adjourn the meeting. Have a great night, everybody.